Hi, I'm Scott from the Poly Music Library, your public music library on the second floor of Bennett Martin in downtown Lincoln. And today we'll go over some basic tips for making your own music to use in videos. Since the COVID-19 pandemic swept around the world, a lot of in-person kinds of meetings and presentations have instead gone online. Besides the use of live conferencing software, a lot of people are making videos in lieu of hosting live events, which is really pretty easy to get started doing these days, with so many cameras and microphones built into modern digital devices. Even lots of good editing software is free. But the trick to give your videos that final professional touch is often adding some music in the background, or having little musical interludes between transitional video cuts. You can find some stock music online, but the free music you can find is pretty limited. If you have a bit of a musical background already, it doesn't take much to apply your skills to making some basic background music to use in videos. And as you gain more skill and confidence in making this kind of music, you may find that it's something you can do as a job, or at least something to supplement your income while having some musical fun. Now that we find ourselves in this unique era of social distancing, obviously a lot more information is being circulated through videos, but I think this is also going to change many consumer expectations going forward. People will want more video alternatives to in-person meetings, presentations, and events, and both approaches will move forward in a new kind of coexistence. I've been getting lots of questions from library patrons and even staff about music for videos lately, so here's your chance to get started in a field that's likely to grow very quickly. I'm going to keep this a pretty basic tutorial and show you how to get started with core concepts and inexpensive equipment. But if you want to get even more serious about it, stay tuned toward the end of the video, and I'm going to talk about some books that you can check out from the Poly Music Library to learn much more about making music for film, television, animation, and video games, all very fun fields to work in as a musician. So let's talk equipment. For the purposes of this tutorial, we're going to work with a minimum of equipment to make this music. If you have an Apple computer product, you already have GarageBand installed for free, which can record your work and also has some soft synth functionality built in. If you're on a PC, you can use the free recording software Audacity to record your work, but you'll need to find a free soft synth to use. If you just Google free soft synth Windows or free soft synth PC, you'll find some options to play with. For note entry, there are a few ways to go. In most soft synths, you'll find a piano roll view, in which you can enter notes manually with your cursor that correspond to a piano shown vertically. But this is pretty time consuming, and instead I'd suggest using a USB MIDI keyboard. There are tons of these on the market in a variety of sizes, starting around $100. It's an investment you'll probably find worth it if you start doing a lot of these videos. Here's a little setup I use with my laptop, being inspected here by my feline audio engineer. If you're going to record any additional instruments or voice, you'll also want an audio interface, which takes signals from a microphone or instrument cable and sends them to your computer via USB or Firewire or whatever standard you choose. And you can find really basic USB audio interfaces for under $50, and fancier ones go up from there. And then of course you'll need a mic and mic cable, and if you're using a guitar, you'll need a guitar cable, etc. So that's the bare minimum for extra gadgets that you might need to get started, and of course you can always get fancier later. Now let's talk about the nature of background music. The first and most awkward thing we have to get out of the way about writing successful background music is recognizing how it ends up staying in the background. It's being used to evoke a certain kind of atmosphere, a vibe if you will, without directly drawing attention to itself, keeping the main action or narration of the video on message. So if you've been a songwriter or composer for a long time, in a way this is a weird exercise. To do the job well, you are decidedly not trying to write the catchiest music you've ever written. If your tune is catchy, it may have a knack for bringing itself out of the background and into the foreground, competing with the main message of your video. So recognize this up front. Once we settle on the general kind of music needed for the video project, we're going to think about the kinds of broad strokes that identify that style as intended, but we're not trying to impart our personality on it. That comes later, perhaps, if we're writing a theme or a jingle. These essential signposts of particular genres might come from a number of musical elements within different genres. Be thinking about notable rhythms, melodic and harmonic approaches, orchestration, 
or what instruments are dominant in particular styles. Tempos, all of these things. To look at a couple of obvious examples, if somebody says jazz, swing rhythms are obviously an important touchstone here, and instruments like upright bass, drum kit, horns, piano, organ, guitar. If someone says dance music, you might want up-tempo electronic drum beats, typically with kick drums on every quarter note, along with electronic bass riffs and short melodic fragments that might drift in and out of a mix. For many types of music within pop and rock genres, you may want to drill down to the specific subgenre you're wanting to evoke to find those right instruments, tempos, and harmonic or melodic approaches. The same goes for cinematic music, a term that often gets tossed around early in discussions about background music, but in practice can mean a lot of different things. Music for an action sequence, a dramatic moment, a romantic spark, an orchestra overture at the opening of a film. Once you have a better idea what will be happening on screen, it will help to narrow down how you might want to approach this. Now let's talk about terms for this kind of commercial music production and how those will affect what you create. You may have a main theme or a jingle that you return to in multiple videos or use different arrangements of in the same video. That would be your foreground music. The music bed, which is your background or otherwise known as underscore music, is what might be simmering underneath a lot of your video. You may have short transitional pieces called stingers or buttons that are used in switching or transitional scenes. These could be restatements of your theme or they could be their own kind of thing. You might make a more heavily orchestrated version of a piece that serves as a full mix version and then segments of submixes from this piece can be used throughout your video in both the foreground and background as themes and music beds as appropriate. This can be a really powerful approach that adds some continuity to the video. There may be moments where you'll need to add sound effects like environmental sounds or faked sounds like footsteps. In huge productions, there is a separate person called a Foley artist who takes on this job. But if you're working on your own, consider how you might be able to add some of these sounds to the soundtrack of your video. If you have that USB audio interface and a microphone, you might be able to take care of these things on your own. A quick mention about sound alikes is in order, because this comes up a lot in video work. Many collaborators might reference a piece of music they already think fits well with their video, and want you to make something similar. In fact, in some huge projects like films, directors sometimes put together their own pre-production scratch soundtracks to get a feel for the direction they want. These are all perfectly fine things to consider, and there are definitely occasions where you'll want to make something that specifically references music the audience will already be familiar with. Just be careful to avoid being too similar, of course, or you might be looking at copyright infringement. Again, go back to those core elements of the music and maybe just focus on a particular rhythm or harmonic approach from the original piece. And that will evoke enough of the original short of outright copying anything. And another quick note about mixing these kinds of pieces. Once you've recorded your ideas, you'll mix down to a stereo mix for the video. Be sure to ask what sampling rate and bit depth the video person prefers for the final product, and start your project recording at least at that resolution or higher. Even if the final product gets squished, you'll start out with better sound, and the final result will sound better. Also keep in mind that you'll likely want to mix drum and percussion parts lower in your mix than you might for a standalone audio project, to keep them from dominating the mix, simmering quietly in the background and you probably don't need to do a ton of compression and normalization to make your final mix insanely loud. Go ahead and leave some dynamic range in there, and the whole thing will breathe better, even in the background. In more advanced writing, for video or film, you may be writing to hit points in the video, where something important happens in the video that needs to be reflected in the music somehow. It could be a sound effect, or your theme is restated, or something changes in the music's dynamics or harmony or orchestration or rhythm to draw attention to the on-screen activity at that moment. In cases like this, it's extremely preferable to be writing and recording that final music after the video imagery is locked or fully edited to its final state in terms of length and where the cuts between scenes or images occur. If you need to emphasize a certain hit point at say three minutes and 18 seconds into the video, you might already have your basic ideas for the music, but some mathematics gets involved at this point to make your hit point sound just right. You'll take into account how many beats per minute your musical idea is, what measure and beat that means you'll arrive at when that hit point occurs, and then you'll have to find a clever way to write or arrange the music to fit. But that takes us just to the edge of what I think we can do with this quick tutorial. Remember, you can always reach out to television, film producers, animation studios, 
the video game industry, live music, theater, dance, all kinds of advertising that appears in unexpected places, from looped videos playing in trade show booths to the music and ads that pop up in games and videos on mobile devices. All of these things need music. So if you want to get more in-depth, here are a few books I'd recommend that you can check out from the library to learn lots more about these subjects. Let's start with Creating Commercial Music by Peter Bell. This is probably the best overview book we have at Poly for getting involved with writing various kinds of commercial music. This goes over the kinds of considerations you'll need to write music for jingles, television, contracting with production or otherwise known as library music companies, as well as technical aspects from software to contracts. The author has had a long career in the commercial music world and uses some of his own work as examples of what to do for success, and in some cases what not to do. I especially liked that Mr. Bell even lists the equipment in his home studio in this book. You can see that there are limitations to what he can do at home, such as recording live drums, which I think is encouraging for those of us who don't have perfect workspaces too. And there are a lot of details involved with making commercial music that differ a little from what you might experience in other kinds of studio production situations, recording songs or bands. For example, the whole process of mastering that happens before albums are produced is greatly simplified for commercial music productions, and audio compression isn't so much a consideration as it would be if you were producing a single for the radio. You'll learn about all those little details in this book. Next we have Designing Sound for Animation by Robin Bouchon. This book dives into the specifics of overall sound design for animated video projects, including both music and non-musical sound effects. It starts with a lot of theory and includes lots of technical details about how all of the oral pieces come together in animation pieces, combining music and sound effects with character voiceovers. This book was published in 2005, so some of the details concerning specific pieces of audio and video equipment used in production cycles have changed. However, Bouchamp also takes the time to explain things like signal processing in a more general manner, so you'll still be able to apply these concepts to new projects with the latest technology. The book also has an accompanying DVD for more hands-on examples. Next we have Composing for the Cinema by Ennio Morricone and Sergio Michelli. We recently lost legendary film composer Ennio Morricone, but we're fortunate that he left us with this book, Composing for the Cinema, a collaboration between Morricone and musicologist Sergio Michelli. The material collected in this book started life as a series of film music seminars the two taught throughout the 1990s. Recordings were made of their lectures, and that material was used to create this book. Rather than an instructional manual on how to compose music scene by scene, Morricone and Michelli look at the intersection of film and music from a big picture perspective, pardon the pun, and break down the kinds of cinematic considerations that inform effective film scoring approaches. Later in the book, Morricone discusses a bit of the business behind film scoring and some of the processes a score undergoes before a film is finished using examples from his own prolific career. You might also want to check out The Complete Guide to Film Scoring, The Art and Business of Writing Music for Movies and TV by Richard Davis. Like the Peter Bell book we discussed earlier, this is another Berkeley College of Music related text written by Richard Davis from their film scoring program. This one focuses on the big screen, and similar to Bell's book, it's a pretty thorough overview that balances aesthetics, technology, and the business side of the industry. I especially like the interview section that takes up a good third of the end of this book. There are lots of high-profile film and television composers, such as Danny Elfman, Michael Kamen, and Shirley Walker, who will give you some great personal reflections and insight on the art and science of film scoring. If you're interested in video game music, we have a couple books for that too, starting with A Composer's Guide to Game Music by Winifred Phillips. If you're a musician who is ready to try your own hand at writing music for video games, a great book to help get you started is A Composer's Guide to Game Music by Winifred Phillips. This book introduces you to the general kinds of musical needs within different game genres, the kind of workflow you can expect while a game is in development, how the composer's role fits into development, and the ever-important need for memorable themes and thematic variations to make your work successful. We also have Creating Music and Sound for Games by G.W. Childs IV. G.W. Childs structured this book so that you're thinking like a member of a team building games from the start. You'll know what the divisions of labor are at a video game design company, and you'll be able to ask the right kinds of questions to the right departments when you get involved. 
This book focuses heavily on various technical, procedural, and tool-oriented parts of the compositional process, though. So for more thoughts about what kinds of music will work in various kinds of gameplay elements, you'll need to look elsewhere. Winifred Phillips' book will give you some better ideas in that creative department. But this child's book gets into detail about the kinds of intricate editing of those creative ideas that you might need to execute on a tight timeline. Remember, you can get these books and many more at the Poly Music Library, so be sure to stop by on the second floor of the Bennett Martin Library, downtown at 14th and N Streets. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you soon.